My name is Allison Paquette, and I'm a research scientist here at the Institute for Systems Biology. I study pregnancy, preterm birth, and the placenta. So today I'm going to answer some questions that you might have about these topics and pregnancy health. So the first question we have is, what is a healthy pregnancy? So my answer to that is, it's kind of different for everybody, and you really need to talk to your primary care physician as if you are pregnant, what is normal for you. Generally, as a research scientist, I think of a healthy pregnancy as one that is 40 weeks long, and the baby has no birth defects, it's within the range of a normal weight, and it has reasonable APGAR scores, which are a test that they administer to the baby after birth to make sure it's breathing correctly. Um, for pregnant women, you should be able to engage in normal activities during pregnancy, and you shouldn't feel anything outside of your normal discomfort that comes with like, carrying a baby. So the second question we have is, why is this so important, pregnancy health? Um, and the reason is it's very important to both the mother and the infant to have a healthy pregnancy. For the mother, we want to talk about um, having like good quality of life and avoiding pregnancy complications such as preeclampsia or gestational diabetes because these things can raise your blood pressure and cause unhealthy pregnancy complications that might um, cause problems as you deliver and then later on after delivery. For the baby, it's really important that the baby's delivered healthy because it's a reflection of, you know, the developmental period and having adequate growth. And also, we really want to have the baby avoid the NICU, the neonatal Natal Intensive Care Unit. Um, if your baby gets put in the NICU, it's a very heavy burden on caregivers, like your parents. It's also very expensive. For example, for preterm birth alone, the NICU care for that is $26.2 billion in the U.S. alone. Also, pregnancy outcomes are really important for your baby's later life health and have been associated with a variety of child health outcomes through the developmental origins of adult disease theory. Um, this includes things like childhood behavior um, and developmental outcomes, such as like adjustment to um, entering preschool, like um, behavioral conditions at like 10 or 12. And then it's also associated with different later life health outcomes. And this can include things like specific psychiatric diseases, and it also includes things like heart disease, obesity, and now researchers are even finding links between the prenatal environment and things like dementia or Alzheimer's. So there's a, you're kind of setting the baby stage for like later life health outcomes. So the next question you might be asking is, how can I maintain a healthy pregnancy? And I'm gonna pull this from the NIH guidelines, which um, there's 12 things that the NIH specifically recommends to help with a healthy pregnancy. The first thing is folic acid, which helps with fetal development. Um, it helps with the brain development. The second thing is not using alcohol, tobacco, or drugs during pregnancy. The third thing is if you're on prescription medications, talking to your healthcare provider to understand how those specific prescription medications might influence your pregnancy and how we can come up with a plan to take them during pregnancy. The second thing is avoiding exposure to toxic substances. One example you might hear about is um, lead, which is you know found in a lot of paints and can, can be exposed to during pregnancy. And interesting, high levels of lead can be associated with miscarriage, stillbirth, low birth weight, and premature delivery, as well as later life learning, development, and behavioral problems for the child. Uh, five is following a healthy diet, eating healthy foods, and also six is eating a safe diet which means that you need to avoid specific foods, like undercooked foods, or deli meat, and your doctor can provide you details about this. But the reasons for this, and we're gonna, we might answer this question later, but these foods have bacteria that might normally not affect you, but because there's changes in your immune system during pregnancy, you're more vulnerable to infections from these bacteria. The seventh thing is limiting caffeine intake. And the eighth thing is talking to your healthcare provider about what physical activities you do during pregnancy, and they can talk about your normal routine and how well, you might want to alter it during pregnancy. Uh, number nine is maintaining a healthy weight during pregnancy and finding out like what would be a healthy weight for you to gain during pregnancy, because it's different based on what your starting weight is. The 10th thing they talk about is getting your blood tested early during pregnancy to make sure that you have appropriate nutrients. And Doctors are specifically concerned things about vitamin B12 and iron, which are really important to maintaining a healthy pregnancy. The 11th thing is getting regular dental checkups and making sure your teeth are healthy. And then the 12th thing is like talking to your doctor about avoiding 
any sort of specific infections during pregnancy. And this includes things like sexually transmitted infections, but it also includes things like uh, toxoplasmosis, which is like a normal bacteria that can be found in lots of different places, but you're more vulnerable to infections when you're pregnant. So our next question is, what are the most common pregnancy complications? And as a scientist, we kind of define pregnancy complications as something called like the great obstetric syndromes as the most common ones. And they're kind of called syndromes because a lot of times they're not like a distinct disease, but a series of changes that occur that might happen during early pregnancy and kind of manifest over the course of pregnancy, ending in a clinical outcome. So something like spontaneous preterm labor or preterm labor is an obstetric syndrome. Uh, rupture of the membranes, um, uh, PROM. Preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, uh, stillbirth, and then babies that are born really small or large for gestational age are known as the great obstetric syndromes. The next question you might be asking is, what exactly is preterm birth? Which is a really popular topic in pregnancy. And preterm birth is a really broad definition, actually, um, for any sort of pregnancy that ends before 37 weeks. And there's many different reasons that your pregnancy might end before 37 weeks. Um, one reason this is responsible for 12% of pregnancies is if you're having twins, triplets, or multiple gestation. Those pregnancies just don't last as long. Another reason that's responsible for 9% of preterm birth if there's some sort of severe pregnancy complication that results in in utero death. So that leaves 80% of remaining pregnancies that are born preterm. Um, 20% of those are babies that are delivered because of specific medical indications, such as preeclampsia. So with preeclampsia, your blood pressure will go up over the course of pregnancy. It's very dangerous to the mother. And the only solution is to deliver the baby. Um, another example of a medical indication that might make you deliver early is if you have some sort of in utero infection. 25% uh, of the preterm birth is because um, the membranes rupture unexpectedly before 37 weeks, and doctors need to treat that because it can lead to an infection. So the remaining 35% of cases of delivery before 37 weeks are spontaneous preterm birth, and this is kind of what researchers are still trying to figure out, like what is causing these babies to be delivered early outside of those definitions. So our next question is, why do we need to identify these early on? And in general, like why do we need to know if we're having a pregnancy complication? And the most important thing you can do to stay healthy and safe during pregnancy is carefully monitoring and routine prenatal care. So we don't really have ways to avoid some of these pregnancy complications, and doctors, medical doctors, can only treat women that come in presenting with these complications. So when they come in, they're trying to, like, for example, preterm birth, they're trying to reverse preterm birth or stop it from happening. So they'll give you drugs to slow down labor, and then they might give you lung drugs to specifically speed up your baby's lung development so it can breathe better, even though it's not prepared to outside of the womb. And some other things that doctors can do include treating you with progesterone. Um, they can put a stitch in your cervix, and they also might just recommend bed rest to kind of help you relax. And um, prevent preterm birth. But of course, all of these things, the earlier they're administered, the better chances of a successful outcome for you and your baby are. So the next question that we have is, how has pregnancy changed over time in the United States? So the first thing that kind of happened you know, in the 60s is, prior to hospitalization, people were giving birth at home, but now we give birth in the hospital. And this is associated with less pain for the woman and better monitoring of conditions. Another thing that's really changed a lot, specifically over the last 30 years or so, is the rising and lowering rates of C-section in the United States in non-high-risk pregnancies. So what we saw was that as C-sections became more safer, between 1990 and 2009, the rate of C-sections was increasing a lot, with a peak of 28% of deliveries from um, non-high risk C-sections in 2009. But as doctors began to, and researchers began to study these C-sections, they realized that there's increased risk from C-sections, it takes a long time to recover, and it's also a real burden to the healthcare system. So now doctors are being advised to be more judicious about when they do C-sections, and there's kind of been a change in policy. 
Um, another thing we're seeing, the third thing is, women are delivering later, so the average age of pregnancy is shifting later in time. And this means that more women are actually undergoing high-risk pregnancies, because um, being older when you're pregnant is associated with increased fertility, genetic abnormalities, and also preterm birth. I think the most exciting thing and interesting thing that's happened in the US over this time period is there's actually been major advancements in keeping preterm babies alive. So in the 1990s, there were a lot of advances in neonatal care, so babies that are already born that are preterm, like how can we keep them alive? The biggest thing being cervicant, which helps coat your baby's lungs. And this actually really boosted the odds of survival for babies that were preterm below 30 weeks, which is very early. So what we see is actually a rising rate of preterm birth, but part of that is because there's a subset of babies that would have been delivered before 30 weeks that normally would not have survived, but now they are surviving. So in some ways, this rising rate of preterm birth actually reflects decreased rates of infant and fetal mortality. So the next question we have is, who has the lowest maternal mortality rate? What country, and why do they have the lowest maternal mortality rate? So, um, Finland is actually the leader in lowest maternal mortality rate and prenatal care with three in 100,000 live deliveries. Um, and the reason for this is they have really great health care. They have um, a maternal allowance, which is money that provides you access to better prenatal care. And their health care system really facilitates better monitoring of pregnancy. Um, additionally, they provide this maternity package when you deliver your baby, which provides um, resources for the mother and the baby and kind of ensures equality for all babies that are born. So that's kind of some things that lead to better health outcomes. The next question we have is how does the U.S. compare to this? And the U.S. is actually tied for 46th place um, for maternal mortality. Um, and this has kind of been in the news a lot lately. Um, the reason that we see this is actually the U.S. is a very large country and there's a lot of discrepancies in the mortality rates between different states and counties. Uh, in California, the rate of preterm, or the rate of maternal mortality is 4.5 deaths per 100K live births. And the rate in Georgia is actually 46.2 deaths for 100,000 live births. So that's a tenfold difference in the mortality rate between these two um, different um, states. So it's very different. Our next question is, what is the placenta? And why do we study the placenta? So the placenta is the first organ that's formed by babies during development. And it's kind of thought of generally as a barrier between the mother and the baby, but it's actually performing a lot more functions than that. So it provides the oxygen and nutrients for the baby that it needs to grow. It also removes waste as the baby's growing. Um, it performs crucial maternal fetal signaling and um, it provides kind of it passes information from the mother to the baby about the environment and the placenta is really important because it's the master regulator really of the in utero environment if you think about it because everything that happens to the baby is kind of dictated by the placenta so it has a lot of control over the nutrients the signaling and the communication during pregnancy and as a researcher we're really interested in studying the placenta can kind of act as like a black box or like a recording of what happened during pregnancy to help us understand you know, what was the baby exposed to and what was the environment like during pregnancy. So you might be asking, what happens to the placenta? And um, the placenta is delivered after the baby. It's kind of known as the third stage of labor. So after it's delivered, the, the doctor will examine the placenta to make sure everything is intact and, you know, the placenta was delivered safely and everything was delivered. Then it's kind of up to you what you do with it. Most of the time it would end up in medical waste. Um, some cultures have very specific beliefs or rituals about the placenta and have specific things that they do with it. Um, one thing that's kind of been popularized in the media lately is um, encapsulation and consumption of the placenta. However, the CDC does not recommend this because of potential bacteria that could be introduced in this process. And there's really no evidence from the literature that um, there's any positive outcomes. So another option you have with your placenta is to get involved with a research study and donate your placenta to science. Um, so what happens if I donate my placenta to science? That's the next question. And 
you might have the opportunity or to do this or you might not. It depends on what hospital you deliver at because some hospitals have procedures and studies in place to collect these samples. So when you deliver, any samples that you donate are carefully stored and curated. And then we collect information about your pregnancy based on specific research questions that the hospital or people studying in, involved with the hospital might be interested in. So, for example, one study I'm doing is looking at how specific chemicals that are in the environment might affect the placenta at a molecular level. So to do this, we measure the chemical exposure in maternal urine. And then we map out how this exposure is related to molecular changes in placental tissue. So in this way, we might understand how these different chemicals affect placental development and fetal development. However, beyond you know, studying pregnancy itself, the placental tissue has also been used for a variety of medical applications, including wound treatment, spine therapy, and eye therapy as a couple of examples. So by donating your placenta, you're really helping researchers understand how pregnancy works, as well as potentially helping patients with other diseases. This being said, I should also mention that data science, or data privacy is really important to researchers. So everything that we do as researchers, the data is stored in a way so it's not identifiable. So we have no idea where the placenta came from. So it's really protecting your privacy and minimizing any risk you might have to participating in the study. Um, some additional questions we've gotten is, are there differences between male and female babies? And there actually are a lot of differences we see. So at the molecular level, um, we see differences in gene expression and other molecular measurements that we as scientists can make about the placenta, meaning that things are different in this level of like gene expression or uh, very small changes. For the placenta itself, there's actually differences in the placenta between males and females. Um, boys do grow faster in utero, so but their placenta stays the same size. So the placenta is usually about a third of the size of the baby. For boys, since they're bigger, the ratio is actually a little bit smaller. So what this means is that um, male fetuses can kind of, they're getting more out of the same size placenta, so it's like more efficient, but these babies might be more vulnerable to environmental risks because uh, they're not getting, there's less control of the environment. Then there's really interesting differences in male versus females in terms of birth outcomes during pregnancy. So a male, like if you're a female and you have a, you're carrying a male baby, you're at more risk of higher rates of preterm birth and preeclampsia, where 55% of the preterm births occur in males. Also, researchers are starting to think of like, along the lines like how pregnancy and if you're carried as a male versus a female, how they explain rates of specific diseases that occur later in life, such as schizophrenia or different immune diseases during pregnancy, that they might be have manifested in the environment you're at during pregnancy and it might be different between males and females. Um, the, second, the next question we have is, why do pregnant women need to avoid specific foods? And the reason for this is that your immune system changes a lot during pregnancy because you're basically housing a foreign organism. So in order to like, to receive this organism and to like, um, have a cohesive environment, the mother has to lower her immune defenses and kind of um, dampen her immune response. So in the process of doing this, you're able to maintain the pregnancy, but the placenta and the fetus become more vulnerable. Um, the placenta is very resistant to infection, but there are certain time periods, especially during early development, where the placenta hasn't developed fully and isn't fully resistant to bacteria, which means that the placenta is then more susceptible to pathogens as well. And there's a variety of pathogens that are really important and we're really focused on during pregnancy, which are known as um, torch pathogens, torch pathogens, which stands for, um, it's just a series of bacteria that are um, uniquely, they can uniquely, you can be susceptible to them during pregnancy. And this includes things like listeria, which is found in like a lot of lunch meats and a lot of food. And normally we're not susceptible to it but during pregnancy, we are. It also includes things like uh, toxoplasma, which is normally found also in cooked meat and it also found in like cat litter. So these things you're more at risk of if you're pregnant. And then the most, the newest thing that we've kind of heard of is Zika virus, which is also a tor torch pathogen, which can affect the way your the baby's brain develops during pregnancy. 
So I think that's all the questions we had prepared, but it looks like we've got some more um, questions from the audience. So the first question we have is, why not just opt for a C-section? It seems much easier and safer. So I have a PhD, I don't have an MD, so I can't provide any medical advice. Um, research has shown that C-section, um, it takes longer to recover, and it's actually, in some cases, during normal pregnancy, not safer because there can be um, increased risks of complications. But it really depends on your pregnancy and what's happening at the time. So you really can't make a decision about C-section until you're actively in labor. And people just, uh, your doctor, it's a decision to have with your doctor about if you want to get it or if not. 